Great, thanks, Amber. And hello, everyone, and welcome to today's executive education session, Actionable Steps to Advance Inclusion Now, with our special guest speaker, Dr. Stephanie Johnson. My name is Jim Ludema, and I'll be your host today. I am the director of the Center for Values Driven Leadership at Benedictine University and a professor of global leadership in our executive doctoral program. I wanna begin with a little bit of housekeeping, then I'll share a bit of context for today's session and then introduce Dr. Johnson. After that, we'll invite Stephanie to speak for about 25 minutes and we'll wrap that up by about 12.30 Central Time. Uh, but Stephanie and I will stick around for another 15 minutes for Q&A. And if you have time, we invite you to stay for that Q&A session because it will be very rich, I am sure. In terms of housekeeping, we ask that you please keep yourself on mute with your video off. That will allow everyone to hear Dr. Johnson clearly and also prevent distractions. But we do want to hear from you. Our chat box has been enabled so that you can ask any questions you might have at any time. Stephanie will respond to the questions at the end of today's session, but you can send them anytime you like. And to do that, just click on the chat button, select Center for Values Driven Leadership, and type your question in. The questions will be received by my colleague, Amber Johnson, who will collect them and moderate them after Stephanie's initial comments. Now a quick word about the Center for Values Driven Leadership. Our mission is to help values driven leaders develop themselves and others, build flourishing companies and transform business and society. And there's never been a better time for that than now as we confront what is perhaps the most pressing issue of our time, the reality and destructive impact of systemic racism. Those of you who have joined us for other sessions will know that our center is on a long-term journey to better understand racism, diversity, and inclusion, to amplify voices of diverse leaders and scholars, and to take action. And one form of action is to host these free executive education seminars on addressing racism and building inclusive organizations, of which today's is the third. And you can find recordings of the first two sessions and registration for our next session in the series on our website. And uh, my colleague Amber will share a link to those in the chat box now. Separately, I wanna mention that the Center for Values Driven Leadership is home to an exceptional PhD program designed for senior executives. The program is three years long, so leaders can pursue their degree while they continue to lead their companies. And so if you have ever considered earning your doctorate uh, in leadership, now is the time to explore the program in preparation for our, the launch of our next cohort in April of 2021. Applications are due in November for that cohort. Amber will also share a link to that program uh, in the chat box. And now without further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Stephanie Johnson. We were introduced to Stephanie a few years ago by our colleague, Ron Riggio at Claremont McKenna College, who was one of the world's foremost leadership scholars. And Ron told us, and he was right, that Stephanie was leading the way on compelling and important work. Her research was directly aimed at the business questions around diversity and inclusion that we were asking, and I think you'll see that today. Dr. Johnson is an associate professor at the University of Colorado Boulder in the Leeds School of Business, where she holds a research fellowship. Her new book, which is outstanding and came out in June, is titled Inclusify, Harnessing the Power of Uniqueness and Belonging to Build Innovative Teams. And it's a national best seller, recently hitting number five on the Wall Street Journal's best seller list. I highly recommend it. Stephanie has presented her work at over 170 meetings around the world, including at the White House for a 2016 Summit on Diversity in Corporate America. And you can find her 
regularly featured in The Economist, Newsweek, Time, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Washington Post, and many other outlets. It's just an honor to have Stephanie with us here today. So thank you, Stephanie, for joining us today, and we look forward to learning from you. And I will now turn it over to you to get started. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jim and Amber for having me. You didn't mention on uh, my esteemed list of presentations, having the opportunity to come out to Benedictine to not only speak to this group, but also speak in one of your classes, which was such a thrill. And I got to meet some of the coolest people that I've met so far. Um, so I'm super excited to talk to you today. Usually I talk, for hours, like it's very hard for me to be brief. So this will be a challenge because I only have 20 minutes-ish to talk about this, which is really one of the most pressing issues um, I think businesses are facing, and that's how to create more inclusive workplaces. So we all know um, these kind of stats. So we know that 98% of companies have diversity and inclusion programs, but we also know that 75% of employees really feel no effect from those programs. And 45% of employees report discrimination. So clearly there's a disconnect between what we're doing in our diversity and inclusion programs and the way employees are experiencing the workplace. Despite that, we know that 67% of job seekers today, and this is certainly skewed by millennials and Gen Zers, but 67% of potential job candidates consider diversity and inclusion in their job search. Uh, when selecting where they want to apply and where they eventually accept offers. And rightfully so, because we know that diverse companies just perform better. Um, for every three and nine percent increase, uh, for every one percent increase in gender and racial diversity, you'll see a three and nine percent corresponding sales boost. Companies that have greater diversity on average create two more new products per year than less diverse companies. And if you have just one member of your team that mirrors a new target market, you're 158% times more likely to capture that market. We also know that companies with more women on the board have 36.4 times higher stock returns. And for all of these great outcomes, the question is why? And to me, it really comes down to innovation, which I know is something that you all talk about a lot. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna tell you about a very old study that was recently redone. This is a study that was done in the 1950s um, by a researcher called Solomon Ash, where uh, he invited participants in a laboratory and asked them a simple question of which line A, B, or C is the same length as line X. And if you can see the answer, you can put it in the chat. Um, but what the participant didn't know is that the first three individuals in that room were actually Confederates. So they are in on this experiment and they're told to respond with the letter C. And so the first participant who's a Confederate says C, the second Confederate says C, the third Confederate says C. And in many cases in the 1950s, this fourth Confederate would knowingly give the wrong answer, which is C. Hopefully most of you said A in the chat. Um, but why I'm talking about this now is this study was redone a couple years ago, uh, but they did something a little bit different. So they made the group of Confederates either a homogeneously white group of individuals or they made them more diverse. And what they found was, I guess, two important things. One, you might not be surprised to know that um, conformity is way down in 2018 compared to the 1950s. We're just a lot less likely to conform but even more importantly, when people were sitting in a room with a diverse group of Confederates, um, they were significantly less likely to conform, even less likely to conform. And why that is really comes down to this idea of what we call a shared information bias. That if people look really similar to you, you think they're similar to you, you tend to believe that whatever you know is the same thing that they know, that you have shared information. When in fact, many times we have unique information and we don't know um, that we're the only one who knows something. But when you're in a diverse group of individuals, you don't tend to have that shared information bias. Instead, 
you think maybe they don't know what you know. And so you're more likely to share that key information that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise shared. And that results in less conformity, less groupthink, improved decision-making, and overall just greater innovation. But it's not just diversity. So I worked with many companies over the last five years who said, you know, we have actually been doing a pretty good job on diversity. But as we've been investing in this, we notice we have higher turnover. And in some ways, we have greater conflict. And we're not getting all of the great outcomes that uh, we see in these presentations. And that's usually because those companies have diversity, but maybe they're not capturing the full benefit of that because they don't yet have inclusion. And so some more stats for you. Um, inclusive companies have 2.3 times higher cash flow, 1.7 times more likely to be innovation leaders and change ready. They're 3.8 times more likely to be able to improve their own employees' performance through coaching. And they're 2.9 times more likely to be able to identify and build better leaders. So in short, the benefits of diversity are even stronger when you have inclusion. And this is more important than ever for a variety of reasons. For, you know, at the start, we know that persons of color, uh, women, parents, persons uh, with um, disabilities, mental health concerns, many individuals have been disproportionately affected by COVID, um, making this just like a very important organizational issue. At the same time, we've had an increased focus on racial inequality and violence uh, following the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others that have really made organizations step up and take note of um, the inequities in society. Uh, disabilities and mental health I think has been largely ignored in this um, crisis of COVID where we often would seek social support from those around us. And I think we're a lot more isolated, at least I am, than I used to be. And so there's an increase in anxiety and depression, which isn't at all surprising, but is very important. Uh, we also know that when there's a high disease threat, when people are afraid of getting sick, it actually changes the way we think in these really interesting ways. Essentially, it makes you less creative and more likely to just follow what the rest of the group is doing. So if you think of it like um, in evolutionary time, if there's a strong threat of getting sick and people say, do you want to try the red berry? You might say, you know, definitely um, let other people try it first. And so that let other people do it first attitude doesn't actually create the innovation that we need to deal with the challenges of reorganizing our companies in a way to deal with uh, social distancing. So what's the answer? I mean, to me, it's really inclusive leadership. And I probably would have said this even before COVID because um, I think this is the answer to a lot of the problems that organizations are facing. But um, inclusive leaders are able to ensure that diversity is celebrated, inclusion is created, and that we get to hear all the different perspectives that people have. The way I define inclusive leadership in um, Inclusify is consistent with what we call optimal distinctiveness theory. And it's this idea that, of course, we want to belong, to be accepted as an important part of the group. And at the same time, we want to be distinct or we want to be unique. We want people to see that we're different um, than everyone else. And so it's an optimal level of distinctiveness. That's where that title comes from because you want to be different, but not so different that you're marginalized or pushed out to the side. And if we can see the world through this lens of uniqueness and belonging, we can actually create much more inclusive workplaces. So if you think about your own experiences, if you've ever had to hide your uniqueness, you've ever had to cover um, part of your identity, how that makes you feel. And if you have stories or comments, you can put them in the chat and we can talk about those or if you have questions, certainly add them in. Um, or at the same time, if you've ever had experiences where you didn't feel accepted or you didn't feel like part of the group, you're excluded. Those are usually very bad experiences. We've all had them. Um, but think about how that made you feel. And this is essentially what I found in the book, that when you look at these two things together, you can summarize the ways people feel uh, based on a lack of uniqueness or a lack of belonging.
And so if you're, if you have neither, you don't think you're accepted and no one knows who you are, um, people really describe this feeling as feeling invisible. That they go to work every day, maybe now they're working from home, but that no one acknowledges their existence. And this has a huge negative impact on people's mental health and makes you just want to quit your job. If you've ever felt like you were accepted, but only if you were faking it, so only if you're covering in some way, those people really talked about feeling incomplete. So I might be, I might have belonging, but only because I'm not being myself. And that doesn't mean that if you were yourself, you wouldn't belong, but you just don't know because you're not demonstrating those aspects of your identity. There were also people who felt unaccepted, but everyone acknowledged their uniqueness. They might um, actually even um, overemphasize the fact that they are a woman or a person of color and kind of pigeonhole them as the diversity person. And so everyone else is really similar and you're this one different person. And those people really talked about feeling insular, kind of isolated and alone. If you've ever experienced any of these things similarly, definitely feel free to put it in the chat. And um, to me, seeing these different ways that people don't experience inclusion made it so much more clear how to create inclusion. And that is how to make people feel valued while recognizing their unique identity. So not you're valued in spite of your difference, um, but you're valued for who you are and that includes those differences. So that's our goal. So how do you get there? I mean, that chart gives a few insights. For one, if you just rely on what we call like the myth of meritocracy, you say, I'm, all I care about is the person who does the best on the job. Um, you're not gonna create an organization that has a lot of belonging because it's just instead, it's a competitive, who's gonna do the best performance. And we know that it doesn't really support uniqueness because meritocracy or a focus on people thinking they're meritocratic actually makes us less meritocratic. So in one study, um, participants were assigned to two conditions and were asked to evaluate resumes. And they're the same resumes in either condition, but um, in one half of the group was told, um, make your decision based solely on meritocracy. And the other group wasn't given that instruction. And when told to focus on meritocracy, uh, people actually gave an unfair advantage to white men. So they actually became less meritocratic. If, you, if all the resumes were equal, they should have rated people equally, but they gave a leg up for majority group members. Uh, it also dispels this myth of being colorblind or genderblind that probably many of us um, growing up in corporate America were told this is how you should be, right? You should be, I don't see color, I don't care what your gender is, but if you think about uniqueness and belonging and realize that other people do care about their race and gender, like this is an important part of who they are. So for you to say you don't care about it is actually communicating to a lot of people that you don't care about them. Um, it also discounts the possibility that those individuals might have experienced bias as a result of their race and gender. Uh, another way that um, leaders often went wrong in the research I did for Inclusify was they saw the importance of difference and so really stepped in as a white knight to try to save women or save people of color uh, because they saw them as being mistreated. And that created, in fact, a lot of backlash from other majority group members and in reality didn't do much to really promote women and people of color who and women of color who are really um, just looking for the same opportunity. They don't need to be saved. They're competent enough. That's how they got there. And by just trying to save people, you're actually um, reinforcing the idea of a lack of competence. And the last one is um, many leaders talked about just being really optimistic. Like if you look at college degrees, you know, 51% are granted to women and it's going to be a majority minority society by 2025 and all these things we hear cause a lot of leaders to see it as this is gonna happen naturally over time. Um, but the data would disagree and say that in fact, 
Optimism isn't going to cut it. We need action. For those are the don'ts. Here's some do's. Consider that language or the way we speak, the words we use really matter. Um, one of the other things that really stood out to me was just making sure that no one feels invisible because that's a power that in fact we all have every day is to ensure that everyone around us feels acknowledged and seen. If you do see people who are demonstrating uh, maybe biased language or statements, I say call them in. It's kind of like call them out, but hopefully in a way that doesn't make them feel defensive, but instead teaches them or educates them about um, what they're saying. And then just really try to have more meaningful conversations around these topics. If there's ever been a better time to talk about this, these issues of equality and diversity and inclusion, it's now, this is the best time. And so four little steps forward, um, four little things that each of us can do to build uniqueness and belonging. So one is just to start with having a chat, do some empathy building, uh, because people come first. And in this time where we're all working remotely, I think it's really easy to be incredibly task focused. Like we just have to do our job. We don't see anyone in the office. And so um, we're just like trying to get it done, right? But there's still a need to have that communication, particularly support our employees of color, um, our coworkers of color who are experiencing a lot of stress and pain right now. And so I would say, just have a chat. Try to each week talk to each of your team members one-on-one. -on -one. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them how they're dealing with the stresses of COVID or Black Lives Matters or homeschooling their kids or whatever it is so they know that you actually care. And I would say that probably more than ever before, I'm seeing leaders really um, start to embrace this empathy. And I don't know why it is, but my secret theory is that we've all experienced this certain amount of like pain over the last six months. Um, I think of like my, you know, kids being at home, homeschooling them. I used to have this like, this great thing where they left every day and went to school and had a great time with their friends. And now I have like a lot more responsibility. And so that pain point of experiencing like, oh my gosh, this is tough, makes me much more empathetic to other people who uh, may have had um, challenges before COVID with reliable childcare or their kids weren't yet in school. And it's too bad that maybe it takes experiencing your own pain to feel empathy for others, but we do know that that works. And so it's just a, a time where people are really interested in hearing from one another. Um, number two, because we've redone all of the ways that we do meetings, I think we need to do it in a more effective way. So we can improve the way that we communicate over Zoom, and it can actually even be better than it was when we were face-to-face -face with the goal of learning from every person in the room. And I'll give some pointers on maybe how to do this. Um, one is to send meeting questions out in advance. We probably should do this when we meet face-to-face -to -face too, but particularly in a more virtual world, it's important that people know what the questions are and you can have them send you their answers in advance. And then when you see people's thoughts and input, plan a discussion around those so that you know what each person is gonna say and you can make sure you're um, hearing from everyone. You can reward or even create um, dissension in the room so you don't fall into that group think trap, but you actually do get dissenting opinions by, you can select a devil's advocate and tell this person, you know, you should be dissenting, or if it happens naturally, just reinforce it. Thank you for giving that alternative perspective or um, giving a dissenting view, because that's what's going to make our decision making better. And then I like to do this thing of um, imagining that whenever I'm in a meeting, there's one person in that Zoom that has all the answers that I need to solve the difficult problems that I'm dealing with. And I, in my mind, I think it's not the person who you would most expect. And so as the individual leading the meeting, I'm trying to think of like, as a detective, how can I get each person to really share their views to solve these difficult problems? Number three is to rethink 
what we consider fair. Uh, for a long time, I feel like in organizations, leaders divide tasks um, pretty effectively, especially good tasks. They divide opportunities really well. Uh, and this is a little bit more challenging as we're remote and it brings to light um, the unfair allocation of office housework tasks. Because while we're pretty good at separating out opportunities, um, the data show we're a lot less effective at distributing office housework fairly. And it mostly falls on the sh shoulders of women of color. So how to do that, again, four little steps is, um, even right now during COVID, maybe in these empathy calls that you're doing, ask people, what are the career goals that you have? What are the key experiences that you need? Is it you need to supervise people, you need an expat assignment, you need, probably not right now, but um, you need a P&L responsibility. And when you see what those are, create a timeline around when people are gonna get those experiences, particularly considering some of these things might be challenging and then give people real feedback on their progress toward their goals. And when you're dividing these bad tasks, the office housework tasks, I would say set up a spreadsheet where you have these tasks that no one wants to do, no one gets promoted, but they need to get done and assign them out equitably. If it's cleaning up uh, after meetings, planning parties, getting coffee or food, all things that we're not doing right now, but um, people send me PowerPoints to review, things like that. No one wants to do it. It doesn't help anyone's career, but um, someone needs to do it. And so just making sure those are equally fairly distributed. And then the last one I'd say is make it fun because in so many ways we're lacking that social support and the like common workplace experiences of connecting with people. We need to figure out a new way to have fun. So I would say, look at the old activities you used to do. Maybe you had happy hours before, or you played basketball and try to find culture swaps or new ways to do those that work in a virtual environment and are even more equitable than you, your old activities. Um, so it's probably hard to have dinner, but you can send dinner. You can send dinner to people's houses, you know, order pizzas. And so everyone's having dinner together, even though separate or have a coffee hour. I know my office keeps doing um, happy hours. And I think that's, I think those are fine. It's like another virtual happy hours, more fun than no virtual happy hour, but not everyone drinks. And so it can actually exclude people who feel like, oh my gosh, another happy hour. So maybe coffee hour or start a book club. That's a great way to bring people together with a shared experience because you're all reading a book together. Um, and then, I know Netflix has a streaming service that you can actually stream simultaneously with other people from, uh, even they're in different houses. So you're kind of watching a movie together, even though you're separate. All right, it's like pretty perfect timing. So if you wanna know more about any of these things, we're gonna have a great conversation right now, but um, if you're having maybe challenges building empathy with your team on my website, um, drstephjohnson.com, slash resources, there's actually a deck of questions and cards you can go through uh, with your team that are designed to build empathy without making people have to experience this like awkward feeling of, okay, so now I'm gonna try to create empathy, but instead you just do this team building activity with your team and people really love it and it serves the purpose of creating more empathy. Uh, there's, in the book, there's lots of ways that leaders go wrong and there's a quiz at inclusifier.com if you wanna know maybe your tendency. Uh, if you're here on this webinar, I'm gonna guess this is something you care about, so you might get the score of Inclusifier, um, but look at your second tendency as well. And it gives you tailored advice um, based on your score. If you wanna read more about Inclusify, of course, I gotta plug the book. Um, you can read the first chapter here at this link, um, which I can share in the chat. And because I'm such a huge fan of Benedictine and love this program so much, I'm also offering free books to anyone who wants them on this call today. I guess while supplies last, thousands of people order it. I don't have that many books, but um, you just go to this link and type in the code Benedictine and it'll take the $30 charge off of your cart 
and you just have to pay for shipping to get the book for yourself. All right, let me see if we can, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if we can answer some questions and have some chat. Well, thank you, Stephanie, for that uh, incredible introduction to building uh, inclusive organizations. Uh, and thank you for that very generous offer of the free book uh, to folks who are on this webinar. Really appreciate that. Um, so for the participants, now we want to move into a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session. And we invite you to submit your questions using the chat box. And just as a reminder, select Center for Values Driven Leadership, type in your question, and that'll send your question to my colleague Amber Johnson, uh, who will be moderating the questions along with myself. So maybe to get things started, Stephanie, I have a, a couple of very short questions and then we'll uh, hear from Amber in terms of what's been coming in on the chat. The first one is what's a culture swap? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the idea of a culture swap is just to take an old cultural element that you might've had and make it more inclusive. So if you, um, I know some of my colleagues play basketball at, at lunchtime and that's fine, but it's not terribly inclusive. You can imagine persons with disabilities probably can't go play basketball. Women, maybe they're not gonna go out on the court with a bunch of like very tall men and play basketball or um, just people like me who are like not very physically coordinated, probably not gonna go play basketball. But it doesn't mean you have to stop doing that, but also consider are there ways to bring other people in? So it's, um, you can go watch a basketball game Maybe not now, but that's what the idea of a culture swap is. And in the context of COVID, it's swapping something you used to do for something that you can do remotely. So you can still get that cultural bonding and belonging in a way that's still safe. Gotcha. So those examples like the uh, coffee hour instead of happy hour and so on were uh, examples of that culture swap idea. Great. Thank you. The other one is uh, earlier in your uh, presentation, you talked that you said that language matters, um, which I agree with 100%. But what do you mean specifically there? What kind of language do we need to be careful about? Do we need to pay attention to? Do we need to switch? Uh, what are you thinking there in terms of language matters? Yeah, I mean, some of the common ones that I heard are women being called girls. Um, if you're older than 18, probably shouldn't refer to women as girls, but I can say in my, you know, 42 year old age, like I still get called a girl <laughs> in, a, in a professional organization. Like that's surprising. Um, but, you know, I don't know that people know not to do that. So that's why I'm calling it out and saying, um, let's not call people girls. I think the term minority um, isn't terribly inclusive. You're, you're calling some group like you're less than, you're the minority. Whereas you might say people of color or learn about different ways to refer to um, different racial groups. So I think you know this, but I'm Mexican American and I hear a lot like, are you, is it Hispanic? What does that mean? Chicano, are you Mexican? Are you, um, and I, <laughs> and it's like, there's a lot of different terms and that's okay if you don't know them, but instead of dismissing like, it doesn't matter, but I would say really just ask, like, so you understand, because I have friends who are Puerto Rican who are called Mexican, and they're like, Puerto Rico, really not part of Mexico. So that kind of thing, um, the way we refer to the LGBTQ plus community, like it's just kind of staying up to date on the terms that people are using to be inclusive. And if someone tells you that you've used an inappropriate term, just say, thank you for letting me know. Now I know. Make note of it and don't do it again. It's like, it's not the end of the world, but it's about how you respond to the feedback. If, you know, if you were using a, another word incorrectly, I think people would be open to fixing their language. But in this area, I feel like people are often really defensive. Like, well, how am I supposed to keep track of all this? And it doesn't really matter. But it's just like anything else. Like, we're all just trying to learn. So just say thank you and move on. Terrific. Thanks for that. Appreciate the response. Amber, what uh, are you seeing coming through on the chat? We have a lot of great questions. We may have to stay for supper and just keep talking. 
You know, the very first question we got, I think, is a good one. How do we measure inclusion in our organization? How do we know if our work in this area is working? Oh, yeah. I mean, that is a great question. So there's really hard metrics if you want to measure, I mean, not measuring diversity. I think we know how to do that, right? It's numbers, but measuring inclusion, you can look at things like promotion rates, access to mentoring, sponsorship, leader development. And if you're seeing and turnover is another good one. If you're seeing inconsistencies, like you're hiring 50% women and you're losing them at a faster rate or they're not getting promoted, those are all signs that you're lacking inclusion. And then the other way is there's surveys. And I mean, I can share these. There's free academic surveys you can use with like a pulse survey or included on your employee engagement survey that specifically ask about people's experience of uniqueness and belonging. Like Am I feeling like I have a seat at the table? And are people recognizing and valuing difference? Um, stuff like that. But it's, it, it's not intuitive, right? It's not like we all know how to measure job satisfaction. But I think this is kind of a new construct. So um, it's just new survey questions to add. All right. Thank you. You know, people are asking a lot about language and you already addressed um, that feeling, the fear we have sometimes as white people, I'll speak for myself, of getting it wrong. And uh, your advice was try it, ask, for, ask questions, be humble when you do get it wrong. Um, I hope I paraphrased well. Yeah. How do you, when someone you're around does get it wrong, can you talk more and expand on that idea of calling people in, how to do that conversation gracefully? Yeah. I, so, you know, there's... I don't have like a very easy answer because I'll say um, at like, it can be exhausting to constantly be correcting people. And I know this falls on the shoulders of women and women of color and people of color a lot where um, they feel like this is tiring. Do I really have to say one more time, um, like explain this term. And so I will start by saying, it is not all of our job to always do this, but when you're feeling particularly like energetic one day or you have the emotional energy to do it, um, I like to just say, maybe in private, if I don't think the person's being malicious, but um, just a heads up, like that is not the term that I use to refer to myself. Um, my identity is such like entity, you can say, I've heard this instead, or like someone calls girls, like say, you know, I think um, most people over the age of 18 would prefer to be called a woman, right? And, um, and I'll say like, so I had this horrible experience. I often refer to the men, because I'm a college professor, right, in my class as boys. And I don't know why, I mean, like, I call the girls women, I call, you know, everyone women. And so a student said, why do you call us boys if you call the girls women? And I'm like, oh, you know, it's, you're right. And that, I mean, I think that's a perfect way to say it is just like asking it as a question. And then I just said, you know, my, my apologies. I need to fix that. I need to call you are, you are men. It's just like, you know, they don't look like men to me. They're so young, but um, you know, I'm obviously I wasn't doing it in a malicious way. And I think that's kind of what I found in, the, in the book, like oftentimes there's people who are trying to be hurtful um, in, you know, using, throwing out microaggressions, but a lot of times it's just like people aren't aware. And so just bringing it to their awareness, most people will hopefully try to correct. Terrific. Thank you. Let me ask one more question and then Jim, I'll see if you have any follow-up questions. I could keep going with questions for a while, but two different people have asked about employee research groups or associate resource groups. And if you have any thoughts on, uh, are they beneficial and how can they be organized to help advance inclusion and what resources might they consider? Such a good question. So in fact, one of our PhD students is doing his dissertation on this because there's really not a lot of data. Um, we know, I guess the data we know is that most companies have them, like in Fortune 500, um, like big organizations, they have employee resource groups um, or affinity groups or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. them. Are they effective? I don't know that that has been shown. Um, they might create like social support. So that is one measure of effectiveness.
But if you want them to actually be effective at creating change, then I think the very small amount of data that I've seen would say you need to actually give resources to the employee resource group. So have an executive sponsor include things like employee development, mentoring, training opportunities to um, interact with higher level executives, give them money to bring in speakers or do trainings or whatever it might be so that um, you actually put the resource in the employee resource group. And then in, in that way, it would fill both the social support role, but also trying to create a more equitable workplace because we know that those very subtle things like mentoring, sponsorship, that um, those are very inequitably divided because most of our executives tend to be white men and we all tend to mentor people who look just like us, uh, that in the end, people of color, women of color, um, women in general end up with less mentoring and we know that it has actually a disproportionately positive effect on their career. So if you can weave that into the employee resource group, it's going to have a bigger impact. Terrific. Jim, any questions? Amber, I, I'll encourage you to go ahead with additional questions from the participants. It sounds like you have many and I want to make sure that as many of them yeah. get answered. Um, we probably have time for about two more questions. Okay. Terrific. You know, we have um, a couple of women on the call who are people of color, have identified themselves as people of color, and they talk about the challenge, a handful of challenges. One, um, companies say that they want inclusion, but there seem to be limiting parameters. And then when they take steps to create greater inclusion, for example, starting a, a book club and promote trying to bring voices of Black authors into it, uh, it's not always welcomed. It's not always frowned on, or it's sometimes frowned on. Do you have any thoughts on how to navigate you know, as you're coming into an organization or even as you're established in an organization, how to create space for yourself as a, as a woman of color to, or a person of color to um, broaden the greater experience of inclusion? Yeah, I mean, to me, I have found that the answer is really strength in numbers. So if you create this book club or even create your own employee resource group, which I think is how like Black at Uber and Google and all those got started was really a grassroots movement. When you have a group of people already engaged in this, it's very unlikely that anyone in the organization is not going to support it. If you have had that experience, I would also love to hear that. But like knowing that this group of people cares about this issue, I think you're a lot more likely to be able to bring people in who may not have otherwise participated. And if this were, you know, five months ago, I don't know if I would say the same thing, but in this moment, I, I think most leaders have very open ears and open minds to issues around racial equity and are trying to bring in um, black authors, black presenters, like actually making the effort um, out of, you know, fear or concern. Like they're, people are really stepping up in this moment. And if they're not, I think, wait till COVID's over and leave because that's ridiculous, right? Like if people aren't open to this in this moment, like they have a very long road to change and you can definitely find a better organization to go to. Uh, but in the meantime, like I think strength in numbers, reaching out to people who you think will be allies, um, even if, you know, other women of color and other women, uh, other men of color, uh, white men who you believe will be allies in this group and when everyone's together and then you float it to the top, I think you'll find um, more strength in numbers. Terrific. Great, one more question. Okay. All right. I'll try you to give a shorter answer at this time. Yeah, you mentioned this current context. We're all, so many of us are operating virtually. Any specific thoughts on creating inclusion, environments of inclusion when operating virtually? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, it's like trying to recreate the best elements of your organization in a virtual environment. So maybe it is, you know, having these, um, doing a book club virtually and doing coffee hours and um, having these meaningful conversations, you know, doing the empathy exercise, even though it's virtual. Um, and then, so like taking the best and then actually finding what are the, the real opportunities that we're learning from COVID that create greater inclusion. So I'll say like for women with children, I mean, despite the fact that 
we have our kids around all day, um, and men with children as well, there's things about COVID that have actually created more inclusion in that like everyone's working from home. And um, if you redesign meetings in a way that are more inclusive and have questions set in advance and everything's recorded so you can watch it if you're not there, all of those things are things that we can take away from COVID to actually make our organizations more inclusive when we finally, if we ever go back into the office. Um, because we're doing everything different anyway I think when we rebuild things we can do it in a way that still keeps in mind all of the good things we used to do but adds a whole bunch of new things that create more equitable places terrific Stephanie thank you very much I know that we could go on all day it's such a great topic and um, your um, research around it and your ideas are very stimulating and we're learning so much thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, thank you for being on this webinar today. Um, I know that I have learned a tremendous amount and I'm sure that everybody else has too. I want to just um, make a couple of announcements um, as we close. The first is, um, I just got a, a, a chat from one of our doctoral students and he mentioned that the, um, the uh, specifically the Benedictine promo, promo code isn't working on the website. The price of the book doesn't change. And so mm. I just wanted to let folks know that. And of course, we'll yeah. take care of that uh, um, uh, promptly. You know, let me check on that just because I tried it earlier today and it worked. But if that doesn't work, you can use the code book club and that'll, that'll work. Oh, Sorry. okay. And we Very have some other saying that it did work. So it may be uh, inconsistent results. Oh, okay. Terrific. So then uh, the other announcement, just want to remind you um, that uh, we have additional free uh, webinars coming up. Our, uh, on September 24, I believe it is, we, yeah, September 24 is our next one, and that will be around um, leading connected and engaged virtual teams, building on some of what uh, Stephanie talked about today. And then in October, on October 15, we'll return to this series on addressing racism and building inclusive organizations with a session uh, titled Brain Science and Bias, Understanding How Your Brain Works to Prevent Racism. And we're doing that in partnership with the Neuro Leadership Institute. So uh, use the link um, that Amber shared on the screen uh, if you would like to register for those upcoming events. Um, we'll also uh, share the, uh, the link again uh, about our doctoral program for senior executives and the, that's a place where you can learn uh, about the program and explore any questions that you might have and connect with us around that. Uh, finally, I just want to thank everybody for attending uh, and for doing the work of addressing racism and building inclusive organizations and we are delighted uh, to be in this together. And then finally, thanks again, Stephanie, for sharing so much insight today. Um, we really appreciate you coming. And with that, we are adjourned. I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. So long.